Seeds were planted by your son with the hands of toil. It's not 
mysticism and mythology. It's really physical. There are laws that, that are we can abide by when it comes to spirituality and how that affects us. And they would have these wonderful conversations at this at the dining room table. And there was a guy who happened to be the handyman for Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he was a very smart guy, but he wasn't well, he wasn't highly educated at one of the Ivy League schools, didn't go to Harvard, didn't go to Yale, but he was obviously very worldly and very knowledgeable. And but because he wasn't erudite, they didn't want him sitting at the table, so he had to kind of sit back in the you know, the laundry room, if you will, and listen, crane his ear to listen to the conversations. And every now and then he would chime in and add bits and pieces to these conversations. And after a while, they got to the point where they realized that this guy was, he really knew his stuff. He was, he was really adding to the conversation. So eventually they invited him to come in and join the table. His name? Henry David Thoreau. So that period of enlightenment started to really percolate, and from, from that era, we have the Charles, and, and, uh, uh, Charles Fillmore and Myrtle Fillmore, and we have Ernest Holmes, and we have all of these brilliant minds who really connected the spiritual world with the human world by, by law and by common sense. And so I wanted, to, I wanted to share my experience with you, and this is totally my experience, Leo Buscaglia, always the, my, one of my heroes is Leo Buscaglia. And he used to say that he was going to come and he was going to lay out this incredible smorgasbord of ideas and spiritual concepts. And you have the total and absolute freedom to take one little piece of dessert or, you know, the pie or the meatloaf. Or you can have the whole damn thing if you want to or nothing. You can walk out the door with an empty plate. It's all up to you. My job is just to present this and, and see what you think. So here it goes. Karen, my wife, and I uh, have started to watch this television series produced by Roma Downey and Mark Burnett. They happen to be Hollywood people. And they did this spectacular job putting together this five disc, I think it's a five disc set uh, uh, on uh, the Bible. Just the Bible. And it's the little vignettes acted out by these great actors that the the production value is really spectacular. I would, I would recommend that you, I mean, there's probably hundreds of versions of this kind of thing out there. But this one happens to be called The Bible. And we watched it, and it tells, it tells all of the stories. And you really get a sense of the movement of history. And from the very, very beginning, from the Abraham, uh, Abrahamic beginning of this, this monotheistic group, who we later called the, the Jews of, of Israel, but it really started about four or five, five. by the way, we're gonna cover about 5,000 years of human history here in about 15 minutes, so. So about 5,000 years ago, these people decided that there was one God. Because before then, oh, there were, everybody had yet a God for everything, a God for the toothbrush, a God for the rain, a God for the lightning, a God for the, if you woke up with a headache, there was a God for that. There were gods for everything, and everybody worshiped every place, you know, all over the floor. But these people, I don't, I don't know how it happened, but they were one of the first groups to become what we call monotheistic. They congealed all their gods into this one all-powerful deity, and this was four or 5,000 years ago. And that's Abraham's time. You've heard the name Abraham, was sort of the father of this movement. And he wasn't the first. There were people before him, but that's kind of where the story starts. And as the years go on, we hear all these wonderful stories. You know the story of Lot and his wife escaping, and, and the voice from heaven, God, says, by the way, this is an example of how when you read the Bible, you can read it metaphorically, metaphysically, metaphorically. What happened to Lot's wife when she turned around to look at the city that was burning behind her? Turned into a pillar of salt. You could say, God said, don't turn around and look, which he did. He did. So you could say, well, he turned her into a pillar of salt because she disobeyed. There's a metaphorical, metaphorical, is that my use of the right word? Uh, version of that, and that is, if you choose to look back and dwell on the past, you're stuck like a pillar of salt. Every story in the Bible you can do that with. It's beautiful. 
So it goes on, it goes you know, up through the, the time of Jesus, and what we learned about Jesus, about that time in Israel, in that part of the world, was it was incredibly tumultuous. You know, there were armies and invasions and overthrowing this and overthrowing that, and this little place called Judea had gone through countless invasions and, you know, armies mowing them down and starting all over. And then here, 2,000 years ago, it was the Romans' time. The Romans had come in 100 years ago, uh, before that or so, and now they were the ones who were the overseers. And that particular part of the world was just politically unstable, and there was all kinds of uh, uh, tumult occurring. And Jesus was not the only preacher, uh, charismatic, soothsaying, spiritualist walking around. And as a matter of fact, when he started, uh, quite a few of the people in that in that time frame considered him just another one of those charismatic preachers that walked around healing people and raising the dead, and apparently it was not uncommon for that to happen. I have a book I would recommend that you get or keep in your bookstore or, or get from the library. It's called Zealot. It's by a, a guy named uh, uh, Reza Eslan. I've read this book three times, and after today I'm going to start my fourth version. And basically, it is the historical version of what happened during that time. It's not spiritual. It's not biblical. He really tried to get the, I love this word, the historicity <laughs> of that particular time frame. And he talked, by the way, he talks about the crucifixion, and he really goes into the detail of what happened when the Romans crucified somebody that just was not pretty. If you, that's one of the most difficult chapters to read, because just the things that they did were animalistic, and it was just, it was not good. But what we get from this book, what I get from this book, is what Jesus was saying was, his lesson was actually very simple, in a nutshell. And, and again, this is my take on things. This is from the book of First Luke, chapter 1. So you can take it for what it's worth, throw it all away, I don't care. This is my opinion, and I just want you to know that that's what it's coming from. But I think what happened was there was three there were three thousand years of history before we get to Jesus, where this group of monothe monotheists were building this spiritual system and building this religion and building the temple and building this organization. So by the time Jesus comes along, it's very very well established in the the, the human ego and man's power, ego thing, the temple is the biggest, and you know, you have to do it this way kind of thing, was very, very well in place. And when you watch this, this show AD, you can see that the guys come out, the, the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees of the Sanhedrin, great history, I'm learning all this stuff, and you see them wearing these things that they wore, and the, you know, the temple was revered, they thought, they believed that God lived in the temple, in Jerusalem. That was his house. And it was revered that way. And you get a sense that what Jesus was saying was, you know what? The real truth, the real, the real spiritual truth is love God. What did he say when he was talking about the story of the, the Good Samaritan? A Pharisee was testing him, and the Pharisee asked him, how do you get into heaven? And of course he was testing him to see how, if Jesus knew the the literature. And Jesus said, well, of course, you love your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. Oh, and treat your neighbor as yourself. Both of those are equally important. Not, oh, you have to go to the temple and sacrifice 20 sheep and kiss the ring of the blah, blah, blah and walk around in circles seven times and all that. No. Love your God. Know God. Appreciate God and treat your neighbor as yourself. That's it. So Reza says, But now, word of Jesus and his band of followers has finally reached Antipas's court. Antipas was the king, not, the, not the, the high priest, but the king of Judea. Certainly, Jesus has not been shy about condemning that fox. Nor has he ceased pouring contempt upon the hypocrite priests and scribes, the brood of vipers, who claims to be 
who claims will be dis he claims that they will be displaced in the coming kingdom of God by harlots and uh, tax collectors. Not only has Jesus healed those whom the temple has cast out as sinners, but beyond salvation, he has cleansed them of their sins, thus rendering irrelevant the entire priestly establishment and their costly exclusivist rituals. So Jesus was upset in the apple cart and they were peeled. <laughs> and that's why he had to wind up on the cross. So after the well, the Bible after the up to the crucifixion is the second set of CDs called uh, AD after death. And that's when we learn about the disciples and Paul whose name was Saul, who, as you may know the story, Saul was a, a, a rabid persecutor of Christians, and he was actually tricked, according to this movie, tricked into going to Damascus to find uh, Peter, because he, he wanted to kill him. And on the road to Damascus, he had this epiphany. He was blinded, and, and Jesus himself appeared and you know, said, why are you persecuting me and my father? And it's a wonderfully dramatic story. At that moment, Paul, Saul, had his uh, change of heart, had his epiphany, and became one of the most uh, energetic uh, apostles for, 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 for Jesus. So, uh, yeah, my, my understanding of, of how the, 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 the movement of time worked was, after that period, let's just say 60, 70, 100 years after the death of Jesus, the story started to fragment. The stories kind of started to splinter. If you watch these shows or if you watch anything to do with the Bible, oftentimes what you'll see is even when Jesus was alive, even when his disciples and he were sitting around the table, there was argument, there was contention, there was whining, and there was this and that. If I understand right, some people were saying, you know, when we die, do I get to sit next to you or does he get to sit next to you on the, on the right hand of God the Father Almighty? Silly stuff. And after Jesus' death, there was just this rancor between them. And the difference between the disciples that stayed in Jerusalem and, and Paul, who left to go preach uh, far away, two very different schools of how to think about what Jesus meant and what he was and, and who he was to, uh, to us. Fascinating, just fascinating. So even, even in the very beginning, there, was, there, was, there were different opinions and there was some contention. 300 years later, that's the, that's the time frame that I'm interested in learning more about, is the time frame after the disciples were all dead and all of them died really. It was not pretty. It didn't, it, it didn't end well for any of them including St. Paul. But there was about 250 to 300 years that passed, and then we come to the Council of Nicaea. That sound familiar? I'm holding in my hand, tremblingly, the service book and hymnal from my Lutheran church back in Devil's Lake. And if you know anything about the Lutheran church, it's very, the old Lutheran church, is very, very Catholic, sort of. <laughs> sort of uh, Catholic light, we used to call it. <laughs> By the way, I am a recovering Lutheran. I go to meetings. <laughs> and it's fascinating, those of you who come from that, that background, you, you're familiar with this book. Maybe yours was a different color, but we all did the same thing. And I remember starting at eight years old, sitting in the church, I read the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed, which has these words in it. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets, and I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. So, since I was eight years old, I had to recite the Nicene Creed. And what I understand about that process, uh, Emperor Constantinople, Constantinople, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, 
decided that he was going, there was enough of this disparate Christian nonsense, all these books and all these people running around. He wanted to collect everything into one single source, let's call it one canon of uh, scripture and of, of knowledge about what, what Jesus was and what the, the Bible was and what it was all about. And so they had a big uh, conference, the Nicene, um, I can't remember what it was called, uh, in Nicaea. And they got together and decided what was going to be in the book and what wasn't. And this is part of my own prejudice, what I'm going to share with you right now. They had a preconceived understanding of how they wanted it to look. And they all came from this very rigid, uh, uh, I shouldn't say that, let me, let me back up. They came from this background uh, where this particular piece of information worked and this particular piece of information didn't work because it didn't fit this one. So what did they include in the Bible? Or better yet, what did they exclude from the Bible? What are the books that they decided not to put in the Bible? What did, that, what did they say? Fascinating. So that happened. And then we have this two or three or four or five or six hundred year period called what? The Dark Ages. <laughs> Any wonder why they call them the Dark Ages. And then after the Dark Ages comes the Enlightenment, the period of Enlightenment, and then we move to where we are today. And a couple of hundred years ago, we have these incredible thinkers. And then even, even when our grandparents were alive, uh, Ernest Holmes and Charles and Mildred Fillmore, uh, excuse me, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore were uh, around and, and creating these incredible thought uh, ideas. And one of the things that, by the way, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore are the co-founders of the Unity Movement. And what I shared with Cheryl this morning was, my thought about me standing up here talking is, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm giving a, I don't want to have you think that I'm giving a sermon or a homily or a preaching. Because that's not what they thought about. There's no, there's no doctrine. Unity doesn't have, it's called a non-doctrinaire philosophy. There's no, we don't have a book. We don't have a, something that you have to study, like the, you know, the, the, the Quran or the Book of Mormon or the Bible. There's all sorts of sources available for enlightening you into this concept of, of um, spirituality and, and the human world. And so they didn't want to, they just wanted to have meetings. So I kind of feel like we're having a meeting right here. We're having a talk. And hopefully we're spurring some ideas and we can have some wonderful conversations when we go back in the back and, you know, kick some ideas around. Because I don't know. I mean, I'm stumbling through this stuff like you are. I, I feel like I'm ricocheting down the hallway with the rest of us. But it's kind of fun because we get to talk about this stuff and we get to share these ideas. There are five principles in the unity movement. And those of you who are newer may not, <clears throat> may not know what these principles are. Those of you who have been here for 20 years may not know. But there are five basic principles that we like to say that we adhere to. And I've tried to memorize them and I've tried to learn them and, I, and they always go off, I, they always fly out of my brain. But I'm going to share with you the simplest possible way to remember them. It's ten words. Two words for each of the five principles. It's very simple. You ready? It's kind of fun, actually. Since I heard, I heard this in the last Unity talk I went to down in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, Kevin Goodall, anybody know Kevin Goodall? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, soon to be a, 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 an ordained minister. Gave this talk. He's very, incredibly well educated. He's a psychologist. And so you listen to him, you know, your eyes just water because he's, he's just magnificent. He shared the five Unity principles are God is, I am, I think, I pray, I live. God is, I am, I think, I pray, I live. Number one, God is. Charles Fillmore, our co-founder, writes, <clears throat> God is not a person who has set creation in motion and gone away and left it to run down like a clock. God is spirit, infinite mind, the eminent force and intelligent everywhere manifest in nature. God is the silent voice that speaks into visibility 
all the life that there is. This power builds with hands deft beyond comprehension of man and keeps going with all its intricate machinery, universe upon universe, one within the other, ne yet never conflicting. All of its building is from the center to its circumference. The evidence for this runs from the molecule and the atom of the physicist to the mighty swing of a universe of planets around their central sun. So, we also read in the Bible, and I don't need to, I, I, you, you're new thought people, so I don't need to dwell on this, but the concept of, of the allness and the isness of God is replete. Another word I'd love to say, I have no idea what it means, I just like to say it. Is replete in the Bible. This is from Psalms chapter 95. For the Lord is the great God. The great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Principle number one in unity is that everything, you, me, the creation, the energy, the love that we feel, it's all God energy. It's all divine energy. Think of on a scientific level, think of the molecules. You know, you've seen the diagrams of the molecules and the atoms and the little electrons spinning around the atoms and then the molecules. It's all electricity. It's all electric uh, um, particles. Everything, rocks, trees, plants, you, me, the air, the water, every physical thing is this electric particle business. Think of that as being God. It's the air God. This is everything. But it's also the Spaces between those particles, the love energy, the emotional energy, that's also God. So God is all. God is everything. That's principle number one. Principle number two, I am. As you may remember, one of my favorite quotes is an Eric Butterworth quote when we talk about one of the things that kind of gets new age people, new thought people, not new age, that's a whole different ball. New thought people into trouble is this concept of our being uh, uh, of divine energy, and people say, Oh, you think you're God. Well, how about this? Try this out. God is in me, and I am God, not like, not like a raisin is in a bun, but like the ocean is in the wave. Try that one. The wave, if you will, knows that it's not the ocean. It's just a wave. It is created. It lives its life. It ends on the shore. It's just a wave. But the matter that makes up the wave is the same matter as the ocean. It's all the same energy. It's all the same stuff. It's all the same chemistry. It's fascinating to think of it that way. So God is, and I am. I am made of that stuff. Point number three is, I think, and here's where it starts to get really fun. Anybody in here studied Mary Morrissey? Have you done the Mary Morrissey stuff in this? Mm -hmm. Great. Mary Morrissey embodies the concept of harnessing the energy of the divine energy, the universal divine energy, and we on this planet, uh, in this incarnation. She tells a story about uh, a guy that goes into a bank <clears throat> with a check. And he wants to cash the check. And he puts the check on the, the counter, and the guy, the, the person behind the counter says, well, you need to sign the back of the check. And he says, oh, no, 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 no. Because if I sign the check, you could take the check, and you could do whatever you want to, and then I wouldn't get my money. And the person behind the counter said, no, the way the system works, the law, the, the process is you have to put your name, your I am name on the check. And that's the process that begins the process of me giving you the money. Oh, no, 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 I really don't want, I can't do that, I don't, I don't want to do that. And so the lady says, oh, yeah, I, I can't help you here. So he goes, he goes to the next bank. Same thing, I have a check, check is perfectly legal, the bank can cash it, but he doesn't want to put his name on it. 
Basically, and you have to put your name on it. That's the way the law is. That's the way the system works. I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm sorry. Goes to the third bank. Goes through the same process. And finally, this bewildered teller reaches down and pulls out of her cupboard down there one of those big long rulers and goes flack on the top of his head. And I said, now sign the check. And he dutifully signs the check. And he gets his money because that's how the system is supposed to work. And then he goes back to the first bank with a big handful of money and he says, see the bank down the street, give me my money. And the teller said, yeah, I know, but I'll bet you still had to operate according to the system. And the guy says, yeah, I know, but you know, nobody ever explained it to me like that before. <laughs> So, the third concept, or the third principle of unity, by the way, when you go home tonight, you can just Google five principles of unity, and these five principles come up. The third one is, I think. We have the ability, if we're willing to operate according to the very, very clearly defined laws of the universe, the spiritual laws of the universe, which Mary Morrissey is so adept at outlining for us, how we can live the life the way we're meant to live it, in health, in harmony with God, in peace, in prosperity. All of these things are completely possible given that we use our brain to follow the laws that have been set down, even the laws that have been set down in the Bible. It's not a complicated process. It's not particularly easy, but it's not complicated following these laws. And that's the, I think. The fourth principle is I pray. It is ours to Thoughts and ideas. 
ideas that return to you manifest. Because you're clear and forthright and positive. It's so beautiful. And then There is a time, there is a place, there are angels in our gallery. There is a way to tell the story and make it stick. There ain't no trick, there ain't no shit in the ways we live and the way.
There is no security, so little humanity. Everybody's in such a hurry. Too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry. No time for anything in the sky. It's just you, yourself, and I. We must learn to pay attention. Yeah.